Hello everyone, Craig here from the Prehab Guys team. So I just got done recording this podcast with Dr. Jared Vagie, aka The Climbing Doctor, aka my mentor from PT school. So when Mike Arash and I were first year students at the University of Southern California, at the end of our spring semester, literally two days after our finals week, I received an email that Jared was going to become my new mentor. Not even two days before that, I just got done taking my last practical exam for our orthopedic class and Jared was actually the instructor grading me. He was watching everything that I was doing from every single angle. He was asking really challenging questions. I was a little nervous when I walked out of that practical but also at the same time I felt confident with what I did and I did very well. Uh, My grades reflected that. And then when I received the email, I was was actually pretty excited because I looked up to Jared. I really liked everything that he was doing. And whenever I would have discussions with him, I was like, this this guy asked really good questions. Um, So I always felt like I was learning when I was chatting with him. And we hit it right off. I mean, Jared was actually one of the first clinical faculty people that we told about the prehab guys. I remember we we made the prehab guys on like a Sunday, and then later that week during lunch, I showed him it. I showed him uh, the Instagram page and sort of what we were doing, and he was all for it. He got pretty psyched up about it. And it all makes sense after talking to him during this podcast, because you'll learn that Jared actually went all in on rock climbing, He was doing it a ton and he actually injured himself when he was a PT student at USC during his last year. However, at that time, there really wasn't much information on rock climbing injuries or rock climbing rehab. Jared took it upon himself to rehab himself, study it, uh, write about it, discuss it, and here you have it, The Climbing Doctor. So I titled this podcast talking and analyzing risk with the climbing doctor. You would assume that those risks are related to rock climbing, but actually in this podcast, we talk a lot about taking risk with your profession. Now, it may not make the most sense right now due to the pandemic and COVID-19. However, I would say in my opinion, job security as a physical therapist is pretty darn high. Uh, you can you can absolutely consider taking the risk of pursuing your pr- passion, pursuing your your uh, your side hustle, your passion project, whatever you want to call it. And as long as you can minimize the risk associated with it, and you're not going to put yourself in a really bad place, like what what is there to lose? Why not? Uh, if that thought is always going to be in the back of your head, you're going to beat yourself up over that stuff. And if you are not absolutely jazzed about what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, then you really need to take a step back and analyze what you're doing and consider, hey, can you afford chasing your passion project while you can? Uh, So I really enjoyed talking about that with Jared because honestly, Jared, Michael, Arash, and I, we would all agree that hadn't we taken risk, uh, we would not be where we are today. And those risks are, they're scary in the moment. Uh, It can feel like there's a lot of unknowns. However, you have to take risks sometimes and I'm really glad that we did. So along with talking about taking risk with your profession, we also talk about analyzing the risk of rock climbing. And there's no one better to talk about this topic with other than Jared. He is the climbing expert. Uh, I've talked with him on the side many times. I've grabbed lunch and dinner with him. I've gone to his course, a two-day course. He has one for the upper body and lower body. And he does an amazing job of breaking down the demands as well as the risk associated with rock climbing from a physical and mental standpoint. So you're going to learn how to help rock climbers during this podcast as well as what are the right questions that you should be asking, how you can relate to rock climbers, and ultimately what do you need to take a look at to help rock climbers continue climbing. So this is jam-packed with value. Also Jared, he's, he's an amazing instructor. He's a really good teacher. So he has a really good way of getting you getting you pumped up during this podcast, really uh, capturing your, your focus. So I think you'll enjoy this one. Without further ado, I'm gonna let you go. Prehab Audio Experience will teach you how to take control of your health through knowledge by optimizing performance, promoting longevity, and keeping your movement system in tune. Welcome to your host, the Prehab Guys.
Today, we have Dr. Jared Viggy, aka The Climbing Doctor. Jared is an expert when it comes to all things rock climbing and physical therapy. Jared is also a well-rounded and established clinician, as well as an educator. He has worked with various athletes and Olympians at the highest level, and he is also part of the clinical faculty at the University of Southern California's DPT program. Jared, it is an honor to have you join the show. Uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Excited to be here. Yeah, so for everyone that's tuning in, uh, Jared and I, uh, we go way back. <laughs> yeah, we go back a few years because at the end of my first year of PT school was when Jared actually ended up being my mentor. I still yeah, it was, remember it was serendipitous. I know. I still remember it to this day because we had our last orthopedic. Um, oh, what are the what are the tests? Uh, Oskies. The, the Oskies, where and Jared ended up being the teacher grading me. And he was, he was on it. He was in it. Uh, he was really critiquing my details. And I was like, this guy's on it. He's sharp. And then uh, like two days later, I get this email that uh, Jared's going to become my mentor. So I was like, okay, well, I clearly didn't fail. <laughs> or, oh, you did great. Or you did awesome. It was good. Or I was thinking, or maybe I did and he wants to take me under his wing. <laughs> so yeah, Jared and I, we've kept in touch. Uh, Jared has been an amazing resource for me more than just rock climbing, more than just PT. Uh, when Arash, Michael, and I, we started the prehab guys, Jared was one of the first people that I showed it. And I was like, hey, man, what do you think of this? Like, should we keep rolling with this? And you were all for it. Yeah, so. and it's really, it's been amazing from seeing the progression of all three of you building this platform that's completely expanded and has really revolutionized and changed how a lot of people are, are looking at preventing injuries and rehabilitating themselves. So it's been really cool to be a part of that process. Yeah. And then we were, we were together not too long ago, uh, helping you film some stuff for USC. So it's been fun uh, staying in touch with you. Uh, you know, I brought it up even after graduation that I'd, I'd hope that we would continue that relationship and still look at you as a mentor now. So I'm really happy that you're on here. And, uh, we're going to be talking about all things rock climbing. Uh, so if there's anyone to ask a question about rock climbing and physical therapy, this is the guy to talk to. So Jared, can you just give us, give us the spiel? How did you end up becoming the climbing doctor? Yeah, well, it's actually, it's pretty interesting. I ran track in college. So this was before graduate school. This was undergraduate. It was at UC Davis and I tore my hamstring. I actually tore it six times and I had, yeah, it was bad. And so I had a lot of challenges with running and, you know, I didn't really know how to rehab myself and I didn't have a good job rehabbing myself. And there was a rock wall that was on campus and I was going to normal physical therapy and the athletic trainers and I was doing my thing. But I looked at that rock wall and I was like, I kind of want to try that. <laughs> and I got on it. And the minute I touched it, I was just psyched on it. And I just was like, this is amazing. And I honestly think that was my mental rehab. That was like my emotional rehab. Mm -hmm. And I just then wanted to climb everything. I ended up quitting my sophomore year track and field at the university. And I started climbing in the gym, started going outside, started doing small climbs of like 100 feet, started doing a couple hundred feet, then started doing big walls. And then I quit my job at one point and I pursued climbing full time. And I, I was all in. And it was a pretty amazing, uh, you know, pretty amazing thing for me. And the job that you're referring to, this is once you were practicing, right? Oh, yeah. So, okay. So let me rewind for a moment. <laughs> so I was climbing nonstop. It was my entire passion. And I ended up then getting into physical therapy school. So at University of Southern California. And that's actually where, where we met, <laughs> yeah, Craig. <laughs> and uh, so I was a student there. I was going to school there. And I was actually living with my grandma to you know, save some money on, you know, on costs and living expenses. And I remember that I was climbing nonstop. I remember it's probably something like six days in a row. And this wow. is, I was in grad school to get my doctorate of physical therapy. And I was training my fingers really hard. And those days, the way you trained your fingers was you hung from the door frames. So Craig, you know the molding on the top of the door? Mm -hmm. So 
I was essentially hanging from the molding with my fingertips and doing tons of pull-ups and doing this nonstop, like six days in a row until my fingers were burning. Oh, man. And I drove out to Joshua Tree, which is a world-class place to climb. It's about two and a half hours you know, out from LA. And I got on this climb, it was called Course and Buggy, and it's a dihedral, which is almost imagine that you have a book in front of you and the book is open halfway to 90 degrees. And inside the book, you know that little crease where the pages are? Yeah. Like right in the middle of it. You essentially have this rock climb that you shove your fingers and your hands in the center of that crease and you stem or you place your feet out on either side of the ends of that book and you make your way up. <laughs> and it was a pretty technical climb for me at the time. I was so tired from hanging on the door frame at my grandma's and from training six days straight. And I got to the end of the climb and there's this final move where you have to exit and top out. My leg is shaking. It's like, it's called Elvis legs, but my leg is basically like shaking back and forth. I'm like breathing heavy. I'm like, I got this, I got this. And I do this one move, I pull through and I hear a pop in my finger. I feel a tear in my shoulder. And then I top oh. out and finish the climb. And I was psyched, but I also tore my rotator cuff and sprained a ligament in my finger. And I should have known better because I was getting my doctorate <laughs> at USC. Um, so, so anyway, so that what ended up happening was I started rehabbing myself. I started developing programs and learning how I could adapt other sports because there wasn't much about climbing at that time that was out there on how to rehab. And then I started putting that all together so I could get better myself. And eventually I reached out to a couple different magazines because at that time magazines were popular. That's how you got your word out. Mm -hmm. And I shared with the magazines, I was able to get a column in a magazine called Deadpoint, Ma Deadpoint Magazine, write some articles in climbing. And I just started putting out lots and lots of content on how to prevent injuries for climbers. I started working with lots of rock climbers from novice climbers to top pros in the world. And I started just traveling around the world, teaching people how to climb without getting hurt. And in the process, you know, I've written some books and, and I've kept climbing myself. That's amazing. This is the first time that I'm hearing this story. What uh, year were you in a PT school? So that was, let's see, that was my third year in PT school. Okay. Yeah. So I was wrapping things up and I was, you know, I was kind of, you know, I, I definitely should have known better at that stage, but I understand, <laughs> I get it because we get so excited about the things that we're doing and I was just all in. And uh, that was close to the time that I was starting in my head to formulate how I could quit my job and move to South America, um, which then if we kind of follow that timeline, I, you know, after school, I went through an orthopedic residency program, which was a year of advanced training. And then I got a, a phone call. I ended up uh, getting an opportunity to pursue rock climbing. And I ended up just quitting my job. I'd been in practice a couple of years and I completely quit my job. I was in an apartment at the time. I just ripped the posters off the wall. I put everything in storage. And I flew to South America to try and do what's called uh, first ascents, so routes that no one's done before, on peaks that had rock and ice and snow at high elevation. And pretty cool process. Yeah, it's uh, that's just like those are the documentaries that I watch on Netflix with my wife, and I'm just like, man, I wish I was this talented to even like consider pursuing this stuff. I love that story. And I know that um, you told me part of that story, especially when I was a student and you were my mentor. And that just, that just completely opened the book. And it was like, all right, anything is possible. Like, that's the beauty of this profession that you can, you can niche down, you can, you can go outside the norm and you can do anything that you want to do. It's just a matter of like, can you make it happen? And are you willing to take that leap of faith? So I'm glad that you shared that story. And man, that, <laughs> that climb is crazy. I can't believe that's the first time I'm hearing about that. Yeah, but it really, it, it, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, I don't think people take enough risks and no, clinicians or you know, people all. even in their jobs right now. You know, I would not be where I am today if 
I hadn't taken some massive risks. And the interesting thing was, is actually before I flew down to that trip to South America, I applied to a fellowship program and a fellowship program was in movement science, which was analyzing or watching how people move. I ended up getting a job uh, interview. I flew up for that interview. I like stayed at a, a friend's apartment and borrowed his tie and his shoes and you know, showed up you know, for the interview. I got the position and then six months later, you know, the South American trip ended and I was in the real, you know, the big leagues doing this fellowship program. And that actually completely changed how I look at any patient as a clinician and completely changed how I approach rock climbing because then at that stage it became all about how people move. And I love how you brought it up because especially in the PT profession, like especially in physical therapy, maybe not right now because of the COVID-19, but job security, in my opinion, is just there are so many opportunities in physical therapy. It's like this is one of the best professions to take a leap of faith and to try something out. And if it doesn't work, it's like, well, hey, you, there's, there's lots of jobs to apply to and a lot of different opportunities that you can explore. Um, so I think that's why it just felt like a perfect fit when, uh, when you became my mentor. And I mean, you, you motivated me to do what we're doing with the prehab guys. So it's just full circle. Well, yeah, and you were, you know, you were doing something that was atypical for most students at that stage. You guys were working so hard academically. You were nonstop. You were, you know, you're even working so hard. You were tutoring, you know, yeah. in, the, in the program. You were tutoring analytical anatomy. But on the side, you know, that was from 9 to 5. Yeah. And then on the side, <laughs> I know at 6 p.m. to, you know, 10 p.m. that you guys were working so hard to develop something different. And you know, you guys had a vision with it and you really, you know, have taken it to that next level. And I think it's inspiring for everyone just to look at models of different people that have, have done something they're passionate about. I think that's what that really boils down to. Yep. And knowing that you don't always have to fit the, the standard mold to, you know, to have enjoyment in your life and to make a big difference. Couldn't agree more. Um, so let's hope that this inspires someone. Um, Let's transition to this. Tell me more about rock climbing. And, and what I mean by that is, what would you say are probably the most common misconceptions that you find yourself telling people about? Or when people ask you, when people learn like, hey, you're the climbing doctor, where does that conversation go? Yeah, so I guess the first thing with rock climbing, it's completely exploded. This was a sport six or seven years ago it was like a fringe sport. If you almost imagine surfing before surfing got popular, you know, when it was just a bunch of beach bums lying around and, you know, getting on their boards, like rock climbing was really kind of a, a fringe sport that was in these tight knit communities that not that many people did. Mm -hmm. And it's been growing and growing. Climbing gyms are everywhere. Climbing now seems like the hot, sexy sport, the cool thing that people do. It's very social. And now climbing's really taken this next level, this next step, especially with its introduction in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And now it's on this kind of large world stage. And I think the big thing about rock climbing is first, a lot of people have some misconceptions of what it really is. So I'll flip it back to you, Craig, and then I'll kind of clarify, but what do you think rock climbing is or what do you imagine climbing is? Because it's, it's multifaceted. There's a lot of different ways to climb, but what do you see rock climbing as? And I'm the perfect person because I'll be honest, I've, I've rock climbed like as a kid, maybe twice in a gym. Um, and I've been meaning to do it. It's one of those things where you, you want to do it when you can't have it. And right now you're stuck in the house and it's like, <laughs> damn, I want to go out and rock climb so bad. Uh, to me, I mean, you know, it just seems very straightforward. It's like you find a wall and you climb it anyway. And, and like you mentioned earlier, there's, there's different type of walls, like people boulder or, you know, you see these, you see these giant big walls uh, where the people use the ropes. Or to me, I think it's a really cool sport because clearly you have to plan and you really have to. Like I imagine that rock climbers, they always have some sort of artistic 
level to their personality because they're able to envision uh, the route that they want to take. And, and then it's just a matter of like, how, how do you climb? How do you, how do you take the path that you design? Um, and how are you able to move your body in the way where you can, you can follow your roadmap without falling? Exactly. And you bring up a couple of different points is, you know, it's outside or inside. It's choose your own adventure, like you're talking about, or the adventure is chosen for you and you have to figure out how to manipulate your body based on the holds. And some things are boulders, like you mentioned, or really big walls. And climbing really boils down to, I see it as there's climbing in the gym. And in the gym, there's bouldering, which is no higher than 10 feet and you have no ropes and you fall, you fall on a mat safely. And there's roped climbing and rope climbing can go in the gym, can sometimes go up to 50, 60 feet. And then you have outdoor climbing, which has the same combination, but then now you're adding in what's called traditional climbing, where when you're in the gym, there's bolts that are in the, in the wall and there's these clips with carabiners and you climb up and you attach the rope into a carabiner and if you fall, then you fall uh, the distance that you are from the carabiner times two, you fall underneath it. And sometimes you can climb where there's a top rope and there's a rope protecting you. And if you fall, you don't fall at all. But outdoor climbing has this other component which is called traditional climbing. And that's the style of climbing that I love because it's a blank rock. And you put these little camming devices in cracks and crevices as you climb to protect yourself if you end up falling. And I find that that gives you the greatest amount of creativity where you can truly choose your own adventure up the route and it's a completely blank canvas. But, but yeah, that's essentially how you described it and then some of the, the follow-up. That's really what climbing is and there's so many different forms. And now there's this high level of competition climbing at the Olympic stage, which is completely like this hybrid between gymnastics, circus soleil, and rock climbing. It's really like this highly competitive, intricate ways for people to work their bodies up a route. And correct me if I'm wrong, I've, I've treated a handful of climbers. And from my understanding, traditional climbing done outside, other than the risk of falling, or especially if you're bouldering um, and just falling to the ground, not having the padding or um, equipment and some of the amenities that you would have as to indoor climbing at uh, climbing gyms. Supposedly traditional climbing is like a little bit easier and better on your body versus when you're doing climbing gyms and you're getting, you're getting it along the more difficult levels. Um, at least I've had two climbers tell me that like the gym climbing is where they've dealt with the most injuries, but that's where they've always gotten injured. Maybe that's just a training area. I'm, just, well, I'm yeah, curious issue, to hear. Yeah, the issue with gym climbing is you have so many routes at your disposal next to each other that the volume of climbs that you can do back to back to back is so high. Yeah. And when you're outside and you're on a route, it sometimes takes you an hour to get to that route and an hour to get to the next route, or it takes you an hour to get to one route. And in that area that you went to, there's only two or three other routes. And so there tends to be less volume when you're outdoor climbing. And when you're traditionally climbing, the intensity can be less because you're fiddling around trying to place this equipment in the rock and you can't focus as much on these highly technical challenging moves that take tons and tons of body force and strength because you need this endurance component to placing this gear to make sure you don't fall. So you're tackling different energy systems with each of them when you're traditionally climbing outside or whether you're climbing in a gym, which would be called sport climbing. And that totally makes sense. I figured it would be a training thing because then you can just, you're indoors, okay, you just do one, you jump down and then you run over to another route, especially if it's more bouldering. Um, so interesting. I, let's transition to this. What would you say are the most common issues that you manage and treat when it comes to rock climbers? And, and, um, and then let's dive into it as well because you'll work with people one-on-one -on -one in person, but you'll also work with some of the best climbers around the world remotely. Mm -hmm. So if you could share a little bit of insight as to, is it similarities that you see? And uh, maybe what are some of the similarities and differences with uh, how you handle 
these people, whether it be in person and remotely? Yeah, so I'd say the most common injuries by percentages are wrist and hand and finger. And the finger is a pulley sprain, so the ligament that keeps the tendons gliding flush on the bone in the finger is the most common injury that you'll see in climbing. So over 40% of injuries are in the fingers with rock climbing. And that's a huge percentage. And giant. if you think it's what? Giant. It's giant. It's huge. And when I treat climbers with finger injuries, I don't start with the finger because then you're just addressing the tissues that are irritated, but you're mm -hmm. not addressing what actually caused that symptom. And that's where we take a step back. We look at their shoulder. We look at their core. We look at their lower body. We look at their foot ankle. We look at their great toe, the flexor hallucis longus, or the muscle that presses your great toe downwards. If that muscle is weak and someone isn't able to put their toe precisely on a small hold, then they're going to have to grip harder with their fingers. And so there's all these things you look at through the entire body. And Craig, how do you figure out how, let's say someone has an injury in their finger, but you want to look at the entire kinetic chain. What do you have to do? What do you have to watch them do? You got you to gotta watch them do some rock climbing moves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's, <laughs> and that's the coolest thing, you know, from you know, my background through going through that movement science fellowship that we talked about earlier, where I literally became obsessed with movement. You have to watch them move. And if someone isn't using the inside edge of their foot on a foothold and they're not rotating their hips in the proper way, then they're going to significantly be loading their fingers more when they're climbing. And that may be the actual reason why they have that injury. And that's why the, like, that's what's crazy. And that's, I think, why I'm so intrigued by climbing because I, I've gone to your course. So Jared has a really good course. He actually has two courses. One is for the upper body. One is for the lower body, which when all this blows over and you have um, some updated courses in uh, Southern California, I got to come to the lower body one. Definitely. But in those courses, you showed so many different rock climbing moves. And that's when it hit me. I was like, wow, this is this is not just an upper body sport. This is not just your hands. This is, this is way different. This is a full body workout. Yeah, exactly. And those moves that we're talking about, and I could, uh, Craig, I'll share those with your listeners. I'll send a video link so people can, can look at those. If you're a rock climber, these moves will all make sense. You do them all the time. If you are not a rock climber and you're listening to this right now, if you just look at these six different movements and you could watch somebody do these on the ground, they don't even have to be on the rock wall. You could start to pick apart how someone moves, why they move that way, and then start to piece together why they have their injuries. And a lot of what we do on the ground then translates to how we may perform that on the rock wall. We're oftentimes a little bit better at the ground because our whole flat, our whole foot is flat on the ground. And then when we go on the rock wall, maybe just your, your toe is touching a hold. Uh, but we can use those movements to start to make predictions of why people have these certain injuries. And I put those together into a warm-up program. So Craig, I'll share that with the listeners Perfect. so they have some access to some materials. So we talk about some of the movements and you can have the people do it right there on the spot in front of you. You can, you can have your climbers remotely video themselves sending this stuff. But then what I would say is, what are some of the more common questions that you're asking? Because for me, I, I just don't know the lingo. You know, like I, I've, I've learned uh, because I have a couple of classmates, guys that you know, and friends that are climbers. And from treating climbers, I've learned some of the lingo. But it's still nothing like if I were to treat a soccer player. So what would you say are like the, the, the right questions to ask as well as the lingo so that you're getting buy-in from these athletes? Yeah, well, first, let me just do a sound bite of what a climber sounds like when they do their subjective interview, when they tell me their story um, uh -huh. of what I'm hearing. And for the, the listeners that are listening, if you're a climber, you're going to understand this fully. If you're not a climber, uh, let's see if you can dec decode this. <laughs> So I was on this gnarly route and I was edging on my inside edge. I decided to go outside edge. I shifted my body weight, rocked up onto my left foot. With my right hand, I went into a gas stone position. 
I may have done a little bit of chicken wing, but I don't think so. I was in the gas stone. I pulled tight. I threw for a, re for a dead point. I got the hold. I then dino to the next hold, stuck it, and sent the problem. <laughs> How do we follow that? <laughs> I, I would just be like, you got a video of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, with any sport, there's a lot of lingo. And I, I learned this early on. So I cycle and I enjoy cycling, but I do not consider myself a cyclist. And I used to do some semi-bike fits with cyclists. And I got basically handed, you know, on a silver platter, the worst possible drilling you know, of someone saying, well, you know, do you know anything about Shimano Tegra components? Do you know anything about X, Y, Z? Do you, all these like higher level things about cycling that I could not talk the talk. And I needed to put myself in my place and say, no, actually go to someone who fits bikes that knows more about this. But mm -hmm. mechanically, I know that your seat should go here to take stress off of your knee. Yeah. And I would just say the same for rock climbers is if you don't climb, you don't know the lingo. Don't try and fake it and talk the talk. Just say, you know, listen, there's lots of climbing coaches who are phenomenal that understand and know movement. And teaming up with them, actually, at a local climbing gym can really make someone's job as a practitioner that doesn't know climbing quite easy. But in the end, you just have them bring in footage of them climbing, and it doesn't matter what they say. You watch them move, and you can start to identify why they may have this injury. So let me pull out an example. So Craig, you're watching a clip of someone climbing and they have biceps pain. So they have this constant pain at the crease of their elbow. You're watching them climb and every move, it's almost like they're doing a pull up. They're just grabbing the hold and muscling, grabbing the hold and muscling. Mm -hmm. Not knowing climbing at all, could you make some inferences of maybe why they have that biceps pain? Yeah, it's just overuse, right? Like why knowing that it's a full body sport, it's like they, they need to be getting help from their lower body. Exactly. So let's say you didn't do that. And we, we gave them just all these corrective exercises, some eccentric load, some scapular stability, all these different things to treat the, the symptoms. Well, if we didn't look at that climbing footage, we didn't get to the source. And yeah. that's a very kind of simplistic example. But what about that same person you're watching them climb and you notice that when they climb, their hips are planar, meaning there's a rock wall in front of them and their hips don't ever rotate. They just stay facing that rock wall. Well, if we think about it, that same person that's overusing their biceps, if you take a look at them and let's say they have longer femur bones, let's say they're a little bit tall, as they take a step up, their center of mass is going to push away from the wall. And the only way to get their center of mass over their toes is to do what? Get their center of mass over their toes. I'm trying to picture this. This is, this is where the artistic uh, personality <laughs> does not roll in with me. Yeah, so then they, they just gotta, they gotta extend their arms, right? They gotta be further away from the wall. Am I exactly, this right? and if they're further away from the wall, they're gonna fall, so they have to bend their arms. Yeah. And then they'd overuse their biceps. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at this footage and you say, oh, maybe you can just rotate your hip inwards towards the wall instead of keeping it planar. And that can allow you so you don't have to bend your elbow as much. You can keep it a little bit straighter. Yeah. And so these are just ways by the more footage you look at, the more you start analyzing movement, the more you could take a little bit more of a holistic approach to assessing why someone may have a specific climbing injury. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of it. It's just as being movement practitioners, the moral of the story is you, you don't have to know the lingo. It's just a matter of, being able to vibe with that person, being able to analyze what they're doing, and then finding that middle ground road where you're able to communicate to them for them to understand it and for you to understand it. So it's Definitely. beautiful. And I think maybe the, the basics, you know, we talked about how, you know, you may not need to vibe with the lingo, but if people listening here want to connect a little bit with climbers, I think just knowing the basics of asking them, do you sport climb, boulder, or trad climb? And asking them what difficulty they, they climb at. And just having that background of just those two things will really help give some perspective. And I think the third thing, and this is just even common questions, is how many years have they been climbing? Because really, if you think about it, someone's been climbing for 15, 20 years, 
they likely have this repertoire of movements that are ingrained where they have some level of skill with the sport. You know, imagine someone who's been golfing 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. but they also have habits that have stuck around for a long time that are tough to break. When you have someone that's just been climbing one to two years, they very likely have bad habits, but they're easier to break, easier to change. And so I think knowing how long someone's been doing the sport is also something that's beneficial. Super valuable. And then uh, give me a little rock climbing lesson here. And when it comes to the difficulties, mm. what uh, you got, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. And they're, what are they called? And it's by numbers. Yes. The Yosemite decimal system is for routes. And that would, that's in the United States. There's, mm -hmm. And it gets confusing and complicated when you start going <laughs> international. But it'll stick to the U.S. And in the U.S., for routes that are not bouldering, routes are taller climbs. It's the Yosemite decimal system that was actually originated in, in California. It wasn't in Yosemite. It was originated, it actually originated in this place called Ida Wilder Takits. So that was two and a half hours outside of L.A. And they go by 510, 510A, 510B, 510C, 511, 512, and so forth. Uh, they go as low as 54. Mm -hmm. And once you get to the 510s, you start adding letters. So 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, and then 510 ABCD, 511 ABCD, and etc. So that's the Yosemite decimal system. And your elite climbers, your intermediate climbers are at 5.9 to I'd say probably 5.11B. Mm -hmm. uh, your advanced climbers are 5.11C, probably to 5.12C. And your, your elite, your you know, very, very high level are in the 13s, 14s, and 15C is the hardest route. Let's segue to that because you treat a lot of professional rock climbers. You're, you're dealing with these guys at the highest level, but also we haven't really mentioned it other than the intro that you do work with other pro athletes that are not rock climbers. Also, you have worked with a lot of Olympians. Yeah. How would you compare the different athletes amongst the different sports? Uh, what's it, what's it like working with some of the pro rock climbers, especially remotely? Um, I'm sure there's definitely someone in the audience interested in hearing about that. Yeah, so I guess comparison, so a little bit of my background, I've been lucky to work with pro athletes at the Olympic level in over a dozen Olympic sports and have done rotations at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, have one upcoming uh, in Chula Vista Olympic Training Center and have worked overseas internationally with the Chinese National Track and Field Team uh, worked with U.S. men's gymnastics up in uh, Colorado Springs. So it's been like a pretty diverse, eclectic uh, experience, you know, with working with Olympic athletes. Sure. Um, and it's not every, you can't, it's hard to classify every athlete at the Olympic level in the same boat. It's almost you have to classify by sport and then obviously by person within the sport. Um, and then for rock climbing, you know, it's been similar. I've been very lucky to, to work with a lot of the top pro, pro climbers. And when I start drawing parallels and differences, you know, it's really fascinating to see that for rock climbers, the difference between other sports that I find with climbing or with most sports, and maybe let's take climbing and track and field, because track and field's a, a sport I've worked quite a bit with. In track and field, 100 meter dash, how fast does that happen? That is instantaneous. You yeah. blink your eye, that race is over. A rock climbing route takes time, precision. You know, it's different dance steps, moves, and you're really slowly moving from position to position. So with Climbers, what I notice, and almost comparing to some of the elite track and field athletes that I work with, the discipline for everyone at the Olympic levels there. Anyone that's that, at, at that level of sport is disciplined and they're going to do what you tell them. Mm -hmm. With climbers, what I notice is they know so much. And I'm not, you know, it's based on the individual, but climbers at that level, they know they've read every article. They've even gone in and gone into research databases. 
They know their anatomy. They know like almost everything about their body. And it's almost like you're going in with someone that has a very high level of understanding and education in biomechanics and they're this almost like research-based problem-solving mind. Um, and when I work with other athletes in different sports, not to say that other sports don't have that. And I think that other sports, you know, lots of people within those sports do. But, and also I'm biased because climbing is my favorite sport and I have <laughs> such a connection with rock climbers. But I find that they just have, know so much and are so engaged uh, with what you're doing and they challenge the heck out of you in a good way. Which is good. Keep showing your toes. Exactly. And they may, you may give them an exercise and you know, the, let's say a specific exercise that loads, you know, biceps long head and you know, some, a specific, you know, muscle within a muscle group and a rock climber may come in and, and ask you and say, well, I understand that biceps long head attaches to my labrum and are there any challenges or issues if I overstrengthen this muscle that it may uh, cause some fraying in my labrum or something like that where you would never, <laughs> you know, think about like who would say that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's just interesting. I, I you know, I, like I said, I, I've been so lucky to work with all these different sports. I think, you know, every sport at the Olympic level, people are so motivated, but I would say that climbers, uh, you know, although it's a very special part of my heart, it's also, I would say that they uh, have a lot of knowledge and information about their bodies. Especially at the highest level, right? Because if, if people are seeking, seeking you out, and I'm sure, I know that we've spoken in the past, they, you are not the first person that they're seeing at that point. So they have a story that they're going to be filling you in on. and. Yeah, I mean, I don't doubt it. And then the couple of rock climbers that I've treated, it's, it's the same thing. They're very, very in tune with their body, just like other athletes. Yeah, Let's, and I, I'd say it even, you know, it's not just at the high levels. You can have someone climbing for two years and uh -huh. they've read every research article, know every rehab. And I'm getting these climbers, the majority of people that I see have seen at least two or three medical practitioners before me. And so I'm getting these highly educated uh, you know, climbers that have read everything about their bodies have tried different therapists. And then when I come and see them, it's, it's showtime, it's game on. Yeah. I got to flex my skills and figure this out. Big time. So I want to segue into this because we haven't spoken about it too much, but you are part of the clinical faculty at USC's DPT program mm -hmm. and you're, you're busier now than uh, when we were students and you were plenty busy then. So I would love to hear how do you balance teaching as well as how do you balance being the climbing doctor and then also just being a treating physical therapist? Yeah, I think in the end balance, I, I've come to realize balance doesn't really exist. <laughs> and I've, you know, I've gone through, you know, up into the stage in my career of always seeking this perfect balance mm -hmm. of seeing patients in the clinic and teaching in the academic environment and seeing rock climbers and running this brand and writing books and creating content and doing these con ed courses and trying to like balance all these different things so there's this perfect alignment and then having a social life and enjoying life right uh -huh. and, and trying to mix that somehow in, into everything <laughs> and i realize it's not possible like you know even now like right now that we're recording this and people listening, they were probably, they may listen to it now or a different time, but this is during COVID times right now. And, you know, a lot of us are at stay at home or locked in. And so with that, I was like, Oh my God, I'm going to have all this extra free time. It's going to be amazing. No, not, not the, at all. The complete opposite. <laughs> yeah. Com yeah. Complete opposite. So crazy. I, I find that it's not possible to balance. And what I end up doing is what I'm passionate, what I'm psyched on, I continue to go full speed. And if I lose steam on something and I'm not as interested in it, then you know I won't put as much emphasis in it. But I've been so lucky that all those things I'm doing in my life right now, I just maintain this psych and I'm still you know, so excited to do all, all of those. 
And so I make this wheel and I have each slice in this wheel and I put a different percent on it. And my goal is to get these different components all equally balanced in one month. You know, that wheel is completely lopsided. Let's say that, you know, my teaching responsibilities are greater that month. And let's say another month, well, I have to publish a book or go through a print run. Well, so maybe the, you know, the climbing doctor brand, maybe that is more of an emphasis that one month. And it's this constant oscillation between all of those. And I think everyone listening and even, you know, yourself, Craig, that's the challenge is, is keeping that balance. Oh, constantly. It's, it, it's a matter of what direction is the pendulum swaying. And it must be a USC uh, residency thing because that, that wheel of life, that slice, I still remember vividly uh, midterm during third year of part-time uh, clinical rotations. I was with Dr. Erica Sigmund, the, the director of the USC ortho residency. And we sat down and we reviewed where, where was my uh, circle of life. How much time was I putting into the prehab guys? How much time was I putting in the sleep and in treating patients and preparing for patients? And it's, it's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. And it's just a matter of where, where do you find equilibrium? And an equilibrium doesn't necessarily mean a perfect aligned balance amongst all the different things within that wheel. But I think that's probably what makes it challenging for us as practitioners because we're always looking at aligning and balancing things when we're, when we're working with people and when we're treating people. So yeah, I had that moment Craig, today. Yeah, Craig, where's, yeah, where's your wheel at right now? Like at this moment? <laughs> yeah, the, the wheel is all online. Um, it yeah. is dedicating so, so much of my time and resources to just pushing our business forward. And, you know, been out of the clinic for almost four weeks now. And the wheel's just evolving. But even earlier today, I was going to say, like, I was, I was really working hard at one endeavor, uh, but I just wasn't feeling it. And that was the first time that it happened in the past four weeks. And I was like, okay, I just need to, I need to shift gears. And when, when the spark comes back, I'll, I'll get back to working on this. But, you know, the, this entire landscape has thrown off the equilibrium and um, it's definitely challenged everything that I do and just like the balance and the routines and it's the wheels always evolving though. Um, there's, there is never a perfect balance. I, I, I feel like a broken record when I speak to <laughs> DPT students about that uh, wheel and the balance, because it's so true. It's so true. Well, Jared, uh, thank you so much. This was awesome. This was jam packed. Uh, I always love talking to you and, um, it was fun getting you today on and uh, recording a podcast. We ask the same question to every single person that comes on. What does prehab mean to you? And more importantly, what would you give to rock climbers in terms of prehab? So what does prehab mean to me? So I see prehab as three things. You have mobility, muscle performance, and movement. So a combination of those three things. And if you can diligently pay attention to all three, now whether it's improving your movement patterns or performing corrective exercises for mobility and muscle performance, then you can avoid getting injuries in the future and you can you know, live your life, do your sport, have all your activities uh, without having any issues. So that's what really prehab means to me. And it actually, in a, on a personal note, so I, you know, probably like yourself, Craig, I prehab all the time you know i'm doing all these exercises and so forth paying attention to my my movements and i realized i took a step back about two three weeks ago and i realized that my prehab involved tons of movement training involved lots of muscle performance and strengthening but i was not doing any mobility work and so I took a look at that circle you know again another pie chart <laughs> and I put another slice of pie in it, which was mobility work. And it was really hard to do, but I've been very diligent three times a day, nice. morning, afternoon, and evening, just like I prescribed to my patients. It is so hard to do things three times a day on a schedule. So hard. Um, but uh, I've been sticking with my mobility schedule. So that, that's what prehab means to me is, is balancing those three and doing it on a consistent basis. 
I, I, I like to call it movement snacks, <laughs> mobility <laughs> nice. snacks. So yeah. when patients come in, they're like, oh, how am I, how am I supposed to do this every single day? Or it, like, do you even make time for it? I'm like, listen, it's just, it's just a little snack. It's a little mobility snack. It's spend like three minutes on it, just like you would eating the snack. Do it a few times a day and you'll feel better. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, I think the challenge is my snack is 30 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's maybe a, a movement buffet. Yeah, that's, a, that's a mobility buffet right there. Yeah, mobility buffet. Um, and I guess the, the second question, I, I believe you asked uh, what I'd recommend for rock climbers. What was the second question you said? Yeah, so say that just a rock climber reaches out to you on social media and they're like, Jared, uh, give, me some, give me some prehab stuff for rock climbing. What would you share? Ah, wow, that's a challenging question. Do we have another <laughs> hour to, you know, to go over? Um, you know, for, for rock climbing, I, I think the, the most important thing prehab wise, all right, if you look at a sport like golf and someone's going to pick up golf, what do they initially do? They go to, um, they go to a, oh my God, I'm blanking right now. They driving go, range? Yes, there we go. <laughs> they, <laughs> they go to a, a driving range and they hire an instructor and they hire yeah. a coach. And the coach takes them through how to play golf. They take, takes them through the mechanics. In rock climbing, how do people rock climb? They go to a climbing gym. They see a rock wall or they go outside. They see a rock wall and they just start climbing. And so if I were to give any advice for someone reaching out, it's get some coaching, get some movement yeah. coaching, learn the movement mechanics of the sport if you haven't been exposed to it. And then in addition, you can do all the, the, the snacks, you know, the prehab snacks and go through a series of different exercises. I have out something, it's the Prevention 7. It's seven different exercises that target antagonist muscle groups for climbers. We can have that as a resource for people, uh, for your Great. community, Craig. Um, and you can do that as a supplement. But above all, learn how to move properly and, and get some coaching with it. I love it. At first, <laughs> when you said... Um uh when uh when i think of prehab i think of three things i was like is he gonna really just name a, a rosh mike <laughs> and uh, myself uh but that's, oh, that's great no so when i think of prehab i think of three things a rosh <laughs> michael and craig that's it <laughs> period i for like a split second i was like no way is he gonna say that oh and that was great though but when i think of the prehab guys that is exactly what i think of nice Awesome, Jared. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, this was this was perfect. I know people are going to eat this one up and um, we'll be in touch. We'll be hanging out soon, hopefully. All right, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this podcast with Jared and I. I hope it got you pretty fired up uh, for anything that involves rock climbing, whether it's you wanting to go rock climbing, whether it's helping a rock climber or just researching more. It's a really cool sport and some of my favorite patients ever have been rock climbers. Outside of listening to podcasts, one of my favorite things to do is watch documentaries. And there are so many good documentaries about rock climbing, about rock climbers. I would search that stuff on YouTube, search it on Netflix. Uh, it's really, really inspiring. Um, one of them is Dawn Wall. Oh, I can't remember the other one off the top of my head, but if you look at Dawn Wall, you're going to get so many other good suggestions. Uh, they're, they're just amazing. They're very inspiring and you'll learn a lot about the sport too. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. It would absolutely mean the world to us. Comment more topics that you want us to cover. Comment and recommend people that you want us to interview. Definitely check out the show notes. Jared was really nice and provided a ton of content to reference that we talked about in this podcast whether it be uh, exercises prehab for rock climbers or movements that you should take rock climbers through in an assessment. Um, otherwise, again, thank you for listening. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and until next time, see ya.